we will be using this board this morning, and some of what we will, I think what we're going to put on the board is worth considering, so it's going to be hard for this group here and that group there to see this board. You may consider moving where you got a better visual view. We started the presentation last night <clears throat> by trying to identify the foundations of Adventism. We had a handout. We printed a hundred of these yesterday. We still have probably 50 or 60 of them. We put quotes on them that we referred to last night. Um, I don't know what happened to them, though. they got to be around here. I gave them to Ramon. Pardon me? I gave them to Ramon. She gave them if to Ramon. If Ramon Chari can yeah. hear me, if he's in the back room with the Latin brethren, uh, we need those handouts. Um, the premise of these handouts, I'm not going to go over them again. We did that last night. Because we have several quotes where Sister White says things such as this, and I'll read you one of them so you get the point. God is not giving us a new message. We are to proclaim the message that in 1843 and 1844 brought us out of the other churches. We have no new message. Our message is the message of 1843 and 1844. There are five quotes that we used last night that are on the handout where she says similar things. On the testimony of two, if things established, I'll read you one more quote so you'll see that I'm not putting my own slant upon this. Um, the truth that we received in 1841, 1842, 1843, and 1844 are now to be studied and proclaimed. Mm -hmm. And the truths that were proclaimed in that history, the truths that make up our message, and we have no new message, are the truths that are represented on those two charts. The chart over there on the left is the 1843 Pioneer Chart, which in early writings, page 74, Sister White says, was directed by the hand of the Lord and should not be altered. There was a mistake on that chart, the year zero. And in 1848, Sister White had a vision where she was told to tell her husband James to produce a new chart. And the new chart is what we call the 1850 chart or the Nichols chart. This is the chart that is on the right there. And Sister White says of that chart, I saw that God was in the publishment of the chart by Brother Nichols, there, and that there is a prophecy of this chart in the Bible. And if this chart is good enough for one, it is good enough for another. So both those charts have the divine endorsement upon them. And they both represent the same truths. The, the 1850 chart in the lower left-hand corner, you'll see the sanctuary message illustrated. That is not on the 1843 chart. They did not understand the sanctuary correctly on that chart. So that's one difference. The other difference is that the 1850 chart is marking the conclusion of the 2300-year prophecy in 1844 for the 1843 chart predicting 1843. They are essentially the same. All the Millerite preachers, every one of them, used the 1843 chart exclusively. They had no other message. That's all that they taught. That's a historical <coughs> fact in Adventism. So when Sister White says, we have no new message, we're to continue to present the message that brought the people out of the churches in 1843 and 1844. That represents our message. And then we read a quote where Sister White talks about the messages. She says, I'll read this to you, this is from Review and Herald, April 14, 1903. <clears throat> The warning has come, thus nothing is to be allowed to come in that will disturb the foundation of the faith upon which we've been building ever since the message came in 1842, 1843, and 1844. I was in this message, and ever since I've been standing before the world, true to the light that God has given us, we do not propose to take our feet off the platform on which they were placed, as day by day we sought the Lord with earnest prayer. Sister White says, the message of 1842, 1843, 1844 is the foundation and the platform of Adventism. And that message is a message that is represented on those two charts. But Sister White, in early writings, page 259, and other places, but we have in the handout uh, the reference see, from I early writing. I need to see a raise of hands. We're going to print some. I need to see a raise of hands for the chart. How many want these printouts? We're not the chart. Yeah. Yeah. Printout. I don't mind. I need 15, 20, 20. Where's Ramon? 50. Where's the extra one? I don't know. He's not here. 50 at least. Oh, yeah, he's but in any case, on this handout, 
we have the passage that begins in early writings, page 259. It's a chapter called A Firm Platform. And in the first paragraph, she talks about the platform and the foundation. They say they can use that little more volume. A little more volume from my own voice? I don't know. Somehow. Somehow. Turn up the volume. There you go. That's easy. Um, <laughs> Sister White has referred to the messages of, that is represented on these charts as the foundation and platform, but in early writings 259 in the chapter that's titled The Firm Platform, she has a paragraph where she warns that there were those that were standing on the foundation and then there was men that stepped off the foundation and began to examine it and saying this could be made better <laughs> and they counseled those brethren to get back on the platform. Some did, but not all. And she was setting on the record for us the fact that the foundations of Adventism were going to come under attack as history progressed in the, in the history of Adventism. And in this passage, as soon as she finishes this, this statement that most of us are familiar with about the platform and the foundation and men stepping off and examining it, the next paragraph goes to the history of Christ where she identifies a progressive testing process. She says things such as this. All those that were not benefited by the teachings of John the Baptist could not be benefited by the teachings of Jesus. If you don't accept John the Baptist, you're not going to be benefited by the ministry of Christ. And she describes this progression of rejection of the message of that time, ending with a statement where she says the Jews were left in total darkness. <laughs> then she goes into the next paragraph where she identifies a progressive testing process in the Millerite history where she says the same thing. If you did not accept the message brought by William Miller, William Miller is a type of John the Baptist, that you would not stand on the right side of the issue when the churches closed their doors on the Millerite message. That was the second angel's message. Um, she says that if you flunked the, the test of the first and second angel's message, you would not be involved with the test of the midnight cry. She described another progressive testing process in the Millerite history that paralleled the progressive testing process in the time of Christ. And the obvious conclusion of this passage in early writings is that we will have a progressive testing process in Adventism at the end of the world that parallels the progressive testing process in the Millerites and parallels the progressive testing process in the time of Christ. And somehow, some way, part of our testing process will have to do with an acceptance or a rejection of the foundations of Adventism. And in our scripture reading this morning, Isaiah 58, 12, and we understand here, I hope, that let, let's make this point. If you turn with me to 1 Corinthians 10, 11, we understand that all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world, or to say it another way, all the prophets are speaking about right here and now in this room. 1 Corinthians 10, 11, says, Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Brothers and sisters, if you don't realize you're at the end of the world when you're having constant earthquakes in the state you're living in, today, where we live in Arkansas, once again, this isn't the first time this year. This is, it's already happened several times where we live this year. They're having another tornado watch where, where we live. And how many thousands of people are dead in Burma from the hurricane? And what's going on with the wars? And what's going on with the economy? Mm. Sister White says in Testimonies, Volume 9, page 11, the leaders of the United States are struggling in vain to put business operations on a more secure basis. If you're not seeing those things, then maybe you don't realize that we are the generation that lives at the end of the world. And you should realize that. That is where we're at. And all the examples of the Bible are an illustration of this time period. Bible teaches upon the testimony of two or three, a thing is established. If you go to Romans 15.4, it teaches the same principle. <clears throat> for whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. So when Sister White's talking in early writing, writing in early writings, page 259, about this, argument over the foundation of Adventism and the platform of Adventism, and then she talks about the history of Christ and the history of the Millerites, this information is to be understood as being pointed directly to our day and age, and I submit to you 
that at the end of the world there will be a progressive testing process. And I submit to you that our scripture reading in Isaiah 58, 12 also has to be applied to the end of the world. And the, those that are being identified in Isaiah 58, 12 are those that we would call the 144,000. And in verse 12 it says, And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places, Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and Lord willing, we will raise up the foundations of many generations today for you to see where you can see it. It's simple. It's a simple presentation. You may not have ever recognized it before, but once you see it, you'll remember it forever, um, Lord willing. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorers of paths to dwell in. This is one of the works that the 144,000 are going to do. They're going to raise up the foundations of many generations. They're going to restore the past to dwell in. And Jeremiah 6, 16 says, The paths to walk in are the old paths. Um, if you want to, it's in the handout that many of you do not have, but we'll turn there just to put this in the record. Jeremiah 6, 16 says, Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways. By the way, Jeremiah, just like Isaiah, just like Sister White, is giving a testimony about this generation, the end of the world. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. When the time comes that God's people are to return to the old paths, whatever they are, there's going to be a controversy among God's people. There's going to be a group that says, we won't do it. We won't walk in the old paths. While there will be a group that will walk in the old paths. And notice the next verse, verse 17 says, And I, I set watchmen over you, saying, to, saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not hearken this week. We're going to show you the sound of the trumpet at the end of the world. We're going to deal with the seventh trumpet. We're now living in the time period of the third woe, which is the seventh trumpet. And it is the message right now that Seventh-day Adventists need to understand. It is the, the marker that the end time events are underway. And the watchmen in Adventism need to be blowing this trumpet at this time, while at the same time returning to the foundations of Adventism. In Jeremiah 18, for a second reference on the Old Past, Jeremiah 18, verse 15, <clears throat> says, Because my people have forgotten me, and brothers and sisters, last night we demonstrated that Seventh-day Adventists have forgotten the foundation. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the Bible teaches very plainly that the foundation is Christ. Mm -hmm. The foundations were for getting Christ, even if they're expressed in different ways in different histories. The foundation is Christ. And for Seventh-day Adventists to forget the foundations of Adventism is to forget Christ. Verse 15 says, Because my people have forgotten me, they have burned incense to vanity, and they have caused them to stumble in their ways from the ancient paths, to walk in paths in a way not passed up. I'm submitting that the ancient paths that we've stumbled from in Adventism are the truths that are represented on those two charts. Um, you'll see in the upper right-hand corner of the 1843 chart over there, the time prophecy of the 2520. That was the first time prophecy that William Miller discovered, and according to William Miller, the time prophecy of the 2520 is the time prophecy that led him to understand the 2300-year day prophecy. Yet there are very few Seventh-day Adventists that have even heard of the 2520, and the 2520 is on both those charts that Sister White identifies as being directed by the hand of the Lord. We have forgotten the old paths. I submit to you that I'm certain there are people in this room to believe the 1290 and the 1335 of Daniel 12 will be fulfilled at the end of the world in a day for a day fashion, and if you believe that, if you teach that, you're opposing the foundational position of Adventism. They understood that the 1290 ended in 1798 and the 1335 ended in 1843. They're represented on those charts, which Sister White said should not be altered. Yet we don't know, don't know that any longer. And in Adventism, you'll find people teaching that foolishness. 
The pioneers understood the year 508 on that chart was representing the daily, and they understood that the daily was paganism, the satanic power. In the early writings, page 74, Sister White says, those that gave the judgment hour cry had the correct view of the daily, yet in Adventism today, we teach that the daily is Christ's sanctuary ministry. That's not a minor disagreement, that's a complete reversal. The pioneers taught the daily was a satanic power, we teach us the godly power here at the end of the world. We have forgotten the old path. And one of the works that takes place at the end of the world is to return to the foundations, return to the old path. The 144,000 will have to take up this work. Amen. That's a recap of last night, all right? I want to get out of the world. Um, and we left some out, but we have been handed out a bit. Where we want to begin now, Lord willing, is to look at... Um, a quote from Great Controversy, page 343. We had an a interesting Sabbath school class this morning, and I hope that I didn't um, cause Brother Reggie um, any problems because we could have a few different approaches to subject, but I was, he was on the, the, the topic that I love to be on, and there was, a, there was a point even where I was going to refer him to this quote, I'm sure he knows of it, um, but he was, taught, he was going to the destruction of Jerusalem and using it as an illustration of the end of the world, and it is. And when you're going to deal with that, a very good quote to use in conjunction then that, with that is Great Controversy, page 343. It says, the work of God in the earth presents from age to age a striking similarity in every great reformation or religious movement. The principles of God's dealing with men are ever the same. The important movements of the present, and brothers and sisters, the important movement of the present is the raising up of the 144,000. That's the purpose of Adventism. That's what we're supposed to be striving to do, striving to be among the 144,000. Mm -hmm. But we're the Laodiceans. Before we can become the 144,000, there's going to have to be a revival and reformation. That's why in Selected Messages, Book 1, page 121, Sister White says, our greatest need and our first work is to seek for a revival. And on page 128, she says, revival represents a renewal of the spiritual life. At the end of the world, God's people are dead. And in a quarter to raise up the 144,000, there will have to be a reformation that takes place among God's people. And Sister White is saying the important movements, the important reformation of the present, here, right now, have their parallel in those of the past. And the experience of the church in former ages has lessons of great value for our time. So, to this morning, this afternoon, we're going to begin to look at the the, the lines of Reformation history, some of the lines, and demonstrate that they're identical. What took place in the deliverance of Israel out of Egypt is identical to the deliverance from Babylon to rebuild Jerusalem is identical to the history when Christ was here on the earth. It's identical to the story of Elijah Carmel that, that is identical to the history of Noah and the ark, and it's identical to the Millerite history. And all those put together are illustrating what takes place at the end of the world when the 144,000 are raised up. And it is easy to see, it takes a little time, but it's simple, simple, simple. Before we go there, turn with me, if you would, to Isaiah 28. Isaiah what? 28. Nice to go through Isaiah 28 and 29 in a very thorough fashion. I don't intend to do that. I would encourage you to follow along with this, though. I do hear some Bible strain. That's good. In verse 1 of Isaiah 28, it says, Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim. So there's a woe pronounced upon the drunkards of Ephraim, and the drunkards of Ephraim are the crown of pride. And what does a crown represent by the prophecy? Leadership, rulership, king, whatever you want to say. This is a this is a woe against the leadership of the, the drunkards of Ephraim. And if you want to know who the drunkards of Ephraim are, just look at verse 14. Wherefore, 
Hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. This is a woe against the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church at the end of the world because all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world. And don't, don't think I'm attacking the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church because before we get done, we're going to see that this is a woe against the laity, so it includes, it includes all of us, all right? In Testimonies, Volume 5, page 211, speaking, commenting on Ezekiel 8 and 9, Sister White says, Jerusalem at the end of the world is God's church. So... The 1 Corinthians 14.32 says, The spirit of the prophets are subject unto the prophets. And verse 43 says, For God is not the author of confusion. So what Ezekiel is saying in Ezekiel 8 and 9, and Sister White's comments on it on Testimony, Testimony 5, page 211, concerning Jerusalem being the Seventh-day Adventist Church, comes right back here to verse 14 of Isaiah 28. The scornful men that rule this people which in Jerusalem is the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church at the end of the world, because all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world. And what is, as, this, as this woe goes on, it goes right on into the next chapter. Chapter 29 says, Woe to Ariel, to Ariel, the city where David dwelt. And if you take a Bible commentary, Ariel is another way to say Jerusalem. You know, it's like... They say Los Angeles, or they say the city of the smog, or they say L.A. It's the same city, but it has different expressions. And this is the same woe in chapter 29. It's being dealt with in chapter 28. Woe to Ariel. And it's going to give us some of the characteristics of the problems that are going on in Jerusalem. If you look at verse 9 of chapter 29, remember verse 1 of 28 said there's the drunkards of Ephraim. Verse 9 of 29 says, Stay yourself and wonder. Cry ye out and cry, they are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers ye have covered, and the vision of all, of all, of everyone, the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed. Brothers and sisters, what book in the Bible is sealed? Revelation. The book of Daniel is sealed, right? Let's read on. And the vision of all has become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he said, I cannot, for it is sealed. The book of Daniel is given to the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and they're asked the question, the reason I say leadership is because it's the learned. It's those among us that have went to our universities and received the credentials. It's the learned. Don't, don't take any, don't get um, relaxed because of that. There's verses that follow. And the book of Daniel, that's the sealed book in God's Word, is it not? The book of Daniel is given to that, and the question is asked, read it for us. And they say, I can't read it because it's sealed up. What is the next verse? Verse 12, and the book is delivered to him that is not learned. That's me. That's, that's the lay people. Right? We don't have the credentials, do we? And the book is delivered to one to him that is not learned, saying, read this, I pray thee, and he said, I'm not learned. The leadership can't read it because it's sealed up, and the lay people, they, they refuse to understand it unless it's taught to them by the leadership. Either way, they don't understand what the sealed book is. They don't understand the book of Daniel, and Sister White says, when we understand the book of Daniel and Revelation as we should, there'll be seen among us a great revival. We have to understand these books. That's what produces the final revival among God's people. That's Testimonies to Ministers, page 113. Yet at the end of the world, from head to toe, Adventism doesn't understand the book that's sealed. And if you drop down, it gives you at least one clue why this takes place. We won't deal with this, but we'll point you to it. In verse 16, let's start with verse 15. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the dark, and they say, Who seeth us, and who knoweth us? Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as potter's clay. Brothers and sisters, we have a, a very nice book that we, that we try to promote, because we believe that the Millerite history is repeated at the end of the world, and this book is written by Gerhard Dan Steed. It's the, the textbook that he uses at Andrews University when he's teaching Millerite history. And... He points out that the fundamental approach to Bible prophecy that the Millerites used, and the Millerites are the ones that established the foundation of Adventism. The 
fundamental approach to Bible prophecy that William Miller had was that Bible prophecy was structured upon the story of two desolating powers. Paganism, the desolating power outside of God's church, followed by papalism, the desolating power out inside of God's church. The Millerites, that's how they approached Bible prophecy. That's what allowed them to come to understand those truths that are represented on those charts that are the foundation of Adventism. And the most important symbol of paganism in the book of Daniel is the daily. The daily is the symbol of paganism. And when you take that symbol and turn it upside down, when you take the symbol of the daily as the pioneers understood it being a satanic power, and you totally reverse it and say it's a godly power, this is Christ's sanctuary ministry, you eliminate your ability to understand the book that is sealed. And that's what's being said here. It's at the end of the world, God's people can't tell what's going on in world history because they don't understand the book, books of Daniel and Revelation because they've left the foundation. In the midst of this, in verse 9, chapter 28, it says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And brothers and sisters, knowledge is important because in Daniel 12, verse 3, 4, 9, and 10, we're told at the time of the end that the book of Daniel would be unsealed and there was going to be an increase of knowledge. And Hosea 4, 6 says, My people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. So this prophetic knowledge, it had life or death consequences. And in the midst of this pronouncement of woe upon the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Isaiah 28 and 29, because they don't understand the prophetic books of Daniel and Revelation at the end of the world, in the midst of this pronouncement, in verse 9 of 28, there's a question raised. Whom's the Lord, who's the, who is the Lord going to use to teach and understand knowledge, the increase of knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. And we won't take time here, but brothers and sisters, the milk, according to Hebrews 5, are the basic doctrines of the Bible. Those people that are called to be among the 144,000 at the end of the world, they shouldn't be struggling over the state of the dead and the Sabbath and repentance and confession. We're not drinking milk at this time in earth's history, are we? Those people that understand the final warning message have set aside the milk of God's word. They have an understanding of the Bible so that they can deal with some of the bigger issues that the Lord unseals at the end of the world. But then in verse 10... He tells us the method that this message, this final message, will be conveyed upon. There is going to be a final warning message. It says, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. And when we get started here, we're going to start taking prophetic line upon prophetic line, here a little, there a little. And we're going to show you how the Lord identifies the foundations of many generations. But I think it will probably take place in the afternoon because we're rapidly running out of time. Now notice verse 11. It says, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to his people. In Sabbath school this morning, Brother Reggie pointed out a truth. He talked about it briefly, but he pointed it out. I don't see Brother Reggie. I'm here. Okay. So you can verify or say so if I'm misrepresenting his word. But Sister White said, we read it in Great Controversy 343, every reformatory movement parallels every other, right? If you go back to those reformatory movements, you'll always find that there was a group of people that had been appointed to carry the message of the hour, but they never do. They never do. Christ didn't go to the Sanhedrin. He had to go to the fishermen and the tax collectors. And William Miller was raised up. Was he a theologian or a farmer? Farmer. He was a farmer. It's always the case that those people that have been ordained to do the work get busy trying to maintain the church organization and forget what the church was supposed to do. And the Lord has to raise up, as Sister White says, men from the common and ordinary walks of life. Okay? So in verse 11, it's saying, for with stammering lips, stammering lips, these aren't people that are trained speakers. These are people that are untrained speakers. Stammering lips. And another tongue. This isn't the ordained tongue. Will he speak to, the, to his people? What people? 
that all the prophets are speaking at the end of the world. This is modern Israel. This is the Seventh day Adventist Church at the end of the world. To whom he said, this is verse 12, to whom he said, he's going to identify this people, to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, brothers and sisters, the refreshing in the word of God, and I have several spirit of prophecies, some passages and passages, uh, refreshing in the latter rain. Isaiah 28, 29 is marked by verse 12 here as taking place in the latter rain. In the latter rain time period, brothers and sisters, when God's people have the final warning message to carry to the world, they're not going to understand the prophetic message, and they're not going to be doing the work, and the Lord is going to raise up another group of people during that time period to finish the work. <laughs> it seems like I'm stretching this, but Sister White says the very same thing in several places. This is an agreement with what we understand as Adventism, even if we don't want to admit it. But in this passage... We're being, we are having identified for us the method of teaching that will take place with the increase of knowledge. And verse 13 repeats this method. Method It says, But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. Now, brothers and sisters, this particular presentation on this subject I, I was invited to give this presentation about three or four months ago, and I put this presentation together here, and you can see it. It's 25 presentations, and we have about 10 here. So we're going to skip over some of it and just move forward. We're not going to, there's no way to squeeze 25 presentations into 10 presentations over this next week. But you can very easily show that prophecy is illustrated upon a line. We're going to go into the next step here. And what I'm suggesting is, is that the message, the increase of knowledge that comes to people in the last days, that message will be taught, it will be understood, it will be conveyed by bringing prophetic line upon prophetic line. So now I would like to take your memory back to Great Controversy, page 343, where Sister White says, every reformatory movement parallels all the other reformatory movements, and they all prefigure the final reformatory movement of 144,000. And at this point, I would like to use the Millerite history, which was a reformatory movement, to illustrate the way marks that are on every reformatory movement. This is where it's good if you can see the board. It's essential almost. Now, let me say something else. For those of you who are sitting over here, and those of you that are sitting here. We've shared this a few places. And this is a very simple presentation. I'm, I'm giving all of you a forewarning here. All right? I'm forewarning you of something that you need, to, you need to take into your memory bank, if you will. This is going to be a simple presentation over the next few times. But I've watched men and women turn on what we're going to say in a way I've never seen any <coughs> information that we shared ever before. You either get this or you don't get it. And if you don't get it, you get strong about your opposition to it. And I believe that's the case because I believe this message is a test. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Those people that have turned against it, that's one of the things they say. Is there's no way that prophecy is a test. Or does it test these people with prophecy? Maybe they're right. But if they're wrong, and this is something that the Lord is going to bring his people to test them, then you need to see the illustration on the board so you understand what we're saying. All right. So... The reformatory movement of the Millerites. I'll give you the characteristics as I understand them. I won't give you all of them. I give you all of them at the start. You're swimming in too much information. That's one of the problems about what I present anyways. I usually give way too much information. But the Millerite history begins in 1798, which was the time of the end. And it ends in 1844, October 22nd, 1844. Familiar, familiar historic points for all of us, right? Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question, just so we know we're on the same page. 
On that, on those charts over there, the easy one to see is the chart on the left, the 1843 chart. In the upper right-hand corner, you will see a time prophecy illustrated from Leviticus 26. It's 2,520 years. How many are familiar with the 2520 time prophecy that's on that chart? Look around, brothers and sisters. How many are familiar with that time prophecy? Please raise your hand high. This is not just for me, but so everyone can see. There's very few of us in this room that are familiar with it. Every Millerite creature taught it. Okay. As we understand it today, there's been, there's been unfolding light on this subject, but I want you to, to recognize that you probably haven't ever recognized before, because based upon the hand, is that there are two 2520 time prophecies. They were a scattering of Israel, and Israel was a northern and a southern kingdom, and the northern kingdom was carried into captivity and scattered in the year 723, and 2520 years later, brings you to 1798. 1798 is the end of the 2520 year time prophecy against the northern kingdom. But the southern kingdom was always also carried into captivity. That's what's illustrated on Miller's chart. And they were carried into captivity in the year 677, which means that 2520 year time prophecy ends in 1844. So when you're talking about the history of the Millerites, even though you may not have understood it before, this history is bookend by the conclusion of one 2520 time prophecy and the conclusion of the other 2520 time prophecy. Amen. Now let me let me remind you of something that's probably familiar ground with you. In 2 Corinthians, if you turn there, chapter 6, verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 says this. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will return again. Do you realize that these verses were fulfilled in the Millerite history? That the process of 1840 to 1844 was to take the Lord taking the Millerites out of the world. That was the second angel's message. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Come out from among them and be ye separate. Have you ever noticed that those verses are a description of the Millerite history? They are. It's easy to see, right? Say amen if you follow the logic. Amen. 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 What it says in these passage, in this passage, is in the process of, of raising up the Seventh-day Adventist Church on October 22nd, 1844. The Lord had to take his people out from the world. He had to create a division in them, correct? Mm -hmm. And in the passage where this is described, it says that those people are what? They are the temple of the Lord. All right? And this separation in the Millerite history took place during the proclamation of the second angel's message. And the second angel's message is Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Now, how many of you are aware that there are five different places in the spirit of prophecy where Sister White compares the second angel's message and the fourth angel's message of Revelation 18 with the two times that Christ cleansed the temple. Sister White identifies, we know, that Christ cleansed the temple at the beginning and the end of his ministry. But Sister White says several times that the first time that Christ cleanses temples parallels the second angel's message, and the second time he cleanses the temple parallels the fourth angel's message. How many of you are familiar with those quotes? Say amen so everyone out there will know they're there. Amen. amen. Okay, so those quotes are there. The second and fourth angel's message parallel the two times that Christ cleansed the temple. And what happened when Christ cleansed the temple? The majority of the people fled the temple, leaving just the poor and the humble and children, correct? Right. Yeah. On October 22nd, 1844, the Millerite movement went from 50,000 down to 50 overnight as Christ cleansed his temple. And as he did so, he did so in conjunction with this passage in Corinthians, and he's going to cleanse his temple here in the near future again 
at the Sunday Law, when the great majority of Seventh-day Adventists are going to receive the mark of the beast, and the minority is going to receive the seal of God. Amen. So what I want you to see here is that the second angel's message, are you with me? Yes. yes. The second angel's message is paralleling the first time that Christ cleansed the temple. Amen? Amen. Okay. So go with me, if you would, to John chapter 2, where we find the first time that Christ cleansed the temple. In verse 13 of chapter 2 of John, it says, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to, the, to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money setting. And when he made when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple, and the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the changers' money, and overthrew the ta tables, and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And the disciples remembered that it is written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Then answered the Jews, and said unto him, What sign showest unto what sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. So what's the subject of this passage? The cleansing of the temple. And then when they ask for a sign, he says, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. So the subject of this passage has to do with the raising up of the temple, the cleaning of the temple, right? But the Jews didn't understand the sign, did they? They thought he was talking about his about the literal temple, and he was talking about his body, correct? <clears throat> so what did the Jews say in the next verse? <clears throat> they said, Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? How, how many years did the literal temple take to be raised up? Forty six years, and brothers and sisters, from seventeen ninety eight to eighteen forty four. From the conclusion of the first 2520 to the conclusion of the second 2520 is 46 years. And in those 46 years, the Lord raised up the spiritual temple at the end of the world. He did it paralleling the first time Christ cleansed the temple. He did it by separating the Millerites from the world. Amen. The 2520 has some profound implications for us. Let, let, me, let me take you to one other quote. This is uh, a great controversy. You've all read this, I'm sure. Page 426. It says, The coming of Christ is our high priest to the most holy place. And when did Christ come to the most holy place? October 22nd. Okay. The coming of Christ as our high priest to the most holy place for the cleansing of the sanctuary brought to view in Daniel 8.14. The coming of the Son of Man to the Ancient of Days, as presented in Daniel 7.13, and the coming of the Lord to his temple, foretold by Malachi, are descriptions of the same event. So when the messenger came to the temple in Malachi, when did he do it? October 22nd. October 22nd, 1844. That's what she says. Let me read it again. The coming of Christ is a high priest to the most holy place for the cleansing of the sanctuary brought to view in Daniel 8.14. The coming of the Son of Man to the Ancient of Days is presented in Daniel 7, 13. And the coming of the Lord to his temple, foretold by Malachi, are descriptions of the same event. Okay, so on October 22, 1844, the Lord suddenly came to his temple. Turn with me, if you would, to Malachi, chapter 3. Yeah, what was that reference? The Great Controversy. The Great Controversy, page 426. Malachi... Chapter 3 is a description of October 22, 1844. Sister White says so. Verse 1 of chapter 3 of Malachi says this. Mm -hmm. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you, sudden, whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. And sure enough, the Lord entered into covenant with modern Israel on October 22, 1844. He's the messenger of the covenant. That's when the covenant was entered into. Even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, I want to ask you a question here. In this verse, which Sister White says is fulfilled on October 22nd, 1844, when the Lord suddenly comes to his temple, 
Let's read verse 1 one more time. It says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Who was the messenger that prepared the way for Christ to come to the temple on October 22nd, 1844? Everyone saying John the Baptist? Oh, the sisters, it's not John the Baptist. It's William Miller. William Miller is the messenger that the Lord used to establish the foundations of Adventism and prepare the way for October 22nd, 1844. So when we take the truths that William Miller was used to establish and throw them aside here at the end of the world, we're on dangerous ground. Mm -hmm. Dangerous ground. Mm -hmm. Sister White says that the angels of God direct us the mind of William Miller. And William Miller is the representative of that history. What do we call the people of that history? Miller. The Millerites. And William Miller is the one the Lord used to raise the foundation of Adventism. And the reason that you said John the Baptist is because you know, William Miller is compared to John the Baptist over and over again. They are parallel to each other. We're going to show you that in a moment, Lord willing. Okay, time check. The history that we're going to start with, the Millerite history, begins in 1798, which is the time of the end. In 1831, William Miller begins to preach. He receives his credentials in 1833. So I marked 1833 for a number of reasons. Not just his credential, but you have the following of the stars in 1833. And if you're using the biblical reckoning of time as the Millerites did, then 1833 actually takes place 10 years before 1844. And the point there is that in the Feast of the Bible, the Feast of Trumpets came 10 days before the Day of Atonement. So when you see 1833, it actually qualifies as 10 years before 1844. Then you can see that 1833 is the Feast of Trumpets that's announcing the Day of Atonement 10 years later. Right? I won't argue if you want to put 1831 for William Miller being raised up, fine. But that is why I put 1833. That's 11 years ago. Yeah, it's not 10 years. Okay, we touched on this a little bit last night. Let's let's touch on it again. The first, who said that? Okay, you know we had a first disappointment, right? I'm not picking on you. This is a point that we need to make for everyone. There was the first disappointment, correct? When was the first disappointment? When was it? Okay, usually people will say it was 1843 because they're predicting the end of the world on, in 1843. But the Millerites were using the biblical reckoning of time, which meant that the year was beginning on March 22nd. So the first disappointment in 1843 was actually March 22nd, 1843. All I'm saying is when you understand that 1833 can, it goes three months into 1834. And by marking this year, you can biblically tie it into this year. But as I said before you corrected me, that isn't what I'm going to be dogmatic about. But if you can, biblically, you can place it ten years before if you get into the biblical record of time. And Sister White says the fall festivals will be fulfilled to the very letter, just like the spring festivals were. So ten years before 1844, you expect to see some marking of the Feast of Trumpets, the falling of the stars, William Miller begins to preach. In any case, William Miller presents his message, which is the first angel's message. And on August 11th, 1840, the first angel's message is empowered. And it's empowered, I'm not putting August 11th, 1840 up here, but on August 11th, 1840, with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and fulfillment of the time prophecy. In Revelation 9, verses 14 and 15, the Millerites had been predicting the end of the world. By the way, that time prophecy that I'm referring to is on that chart. The Millerites had been predicting that the end of the world was going to take place, and they were using the year-day principle to do so. And they also predicted that on August 11, 1840, the Ottoman Empire was going to collapse in fulfillment of a time prophecy of 391 years and 15 days. The time prophecy that is the time prophecy in the sixth trumpet, the second woe, located in Revelation 9, verses 14 and 15. And they predicted the collapse of the Ottoman Empire before it happened, and the whole world 
rejected their thoughts until it took place. So on August 11, 1840, when the Ottoman Empire went down, the year day principle that the Millerites was, were using was confirmed, and suddenly what the Millerites were saying about the end of the world took upon, became more serious to the people that were hearing the message than it had before. They realized that the year day principle worked. So on August 11, 1840, the first angel's message was empowered. We're going we're gonna to mark this. And brothers and sisters, I just have a few minutes for this presentation. I didn't really even notice when I started. I very rarely do. But let me show you something here, if you would. Let me make, let me make two more points and show you something. Testimonies, Volume 1, page 21. Sister White says, In June of 1842, Mr. Miller gave his second course of lectures at the Casco Street Church in Portland, Maine. With few exceptions, the denominated churches closed their doors against Mr. Miller. So in June of 1842, the second angel's message arrived in history. The churches began to close their doors. The Millerites did not understand that. The Millerites didn't understand the third angel's message on October 23, 1844, either. Even though the third angel's message arrived on October 22, 1844, the Millerites didn't understand the implications of that until afterwards. And the second angel's message arrived in June of 1842, according to Testimonies, Volume 1, page 21. And the Millerites didn't begin to proclaim it till over a year later before they recognized what had happened. So the second angel's message goes through history for a period of time. And then at the Exeter camp meeting from August 12th through 17th, 1844, the midnight cry arrives, and the second angel's message is empowered. First angel's message goes through history for a period of time, then it's empowered. Second angel's message goes through history for a time, then it's empowered. Third angel's message arrived on October 22nd, 1844, and we know as Seventh-day Adventists that at some point in time, the fourth angel of Revelation 18 is going to join the third, and it's going to be empowered. So it goes through history also for a period of time, and then it's empowered. All these messages arrive, go through history, then they're empowered. Now, when the first angel's message is specifically marked, turn with me, if you would, to Revelation chapter 10. I'm going to do something here. I've, I've had the privilege to speak with this congregation several times through the year. I don't get I don't get out here as much as some of the speakers do, but I get out here from time to time. And but the congregation changes a lot. It's kind of like always evolving. So I know that some of you don't seem like familiar faces in my mind, but in any case. Um, from past experiences, the amount of you that are going to be here after lunch is going to greatly decrease. All right, that's unfortunate. So I'm going to I'm going to do something here that is really out of the logic of this presentation. I'm going to make a point, and then I'm going to jump forward where we shouldn't get to until the next presentation. The reason I'm going to do it is I'm going to try to challenge your sanctified curiosity so you come back this afternoon. Right. <laughs> In Revelation chapter 10, verse 1. And we, read, we went through this last night. It's in the record what was recorded last night. Sister White comments on Revelation 10. And the mighty angel that comes down in verse 1 with the little book of Daniel open in his hand, she says, is none other, no less a person than Jesus Christ. All right. And she says the fact that he puts his foot upon the land and foot upon the sea, which you'll see he does if you read on, represents a message that's carried to the world. And Sister White teaches us, Great Controversy, page 611, and other places, and the, the Adventist historians confirm that the first angel's message was carried to every mission station in the world in 1840. With the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, when the year day principle was proclaimed, William Miller's message was carried to the world. So we see here Christ coming down, and when he comes down, he puts his foot upon the land and the sea, and Sister White says that marks a worldwide message Therefore, on August 11, 1840, 
when William Miller's message is in power, the mighty angel of Revelation 10 comes down. Now, why am I saying this? This is, this is my book, maybe. As you go through these histories, and that's what we're doing, every reform is the same. They are the same. You will find the same characteristics. Now, normally, I would spend much more time on this line of prophecy. I have much more to say about the Millerite history. Uh, and we'll start in the afternoon on that. But I want to show you a couple other lines of prophecy to try to make a point. In the history of Christ, and in early writings, page 259, which we read last night, which we referred to this morning, Sister White directly compares the history of Christ with the history of the Millerite. That's what the two progressive texts are. She says, if you didn't receive... The teachings of John the Baptist, you could not be benefited by the teachings of Jesus. In the next paragraph, she talks about those who rejected the first angel's message not being benefited by the second. She's making a direct parallel <clears throat> to the reformatory time of Christ with the reformatory time of the Millerites. <clears throat> and Sister White often compares William Miller with John the Baptist. Okay, so, so marking Miller here in 1833 as a waymark corresponds with John the Baptist. And John the Baptist <clears throat> had a message that he was carrying. And there came a point in time where his message was empowered. And Brother Reggie brought this up in Sabbath school today. Um, <clears throat> you can show when John the Baptist's message was empowered because there was a time where the Pharisees were asking Christ a question. They wanted to trick him to forget exactly what the question was. But instead of answering the question, he asked them a question. He says, was the baptism of John by men or of God? And the Pharisees thought, well, if we say it's of men, people will turn on us because they believe that John was a prophet. But if we say it was of God, then John baptizing Jesus is an endorsement. So what empowered John the Baptist's message was the baptism of Jesus. That's where it, with the endorsement was put on it. And brothers and sisters, in each of these histories, there will be a messenger with a message, and his message, when it's in power, you will see a divine symbol come down out of heaven. And when Jesus was baptized, a dove came down out of heaven and lighted upon him. In the three decrees to come out of Babylon, and brothers and sisters, the three decrees to come out of Babylon, this is the first angel's message here, 1840. This is the second angel's message. This is the arrival of the third angel's message. There were three decrees. First decree, the second decree, and the third decree. And the third decree is the starting point for the 2300 year prophecy. And the third message is the ending point. Mm -hmm. These two histories are specifically tied together. Mm -hmm. Absolutely airtight tied together. And the, the captivity of the Christian church for 1260 years in the history of the Millerites, it's paralleling the captivity of the Jews in Babylon. When they came out of Babylon, it's a type of the Christian church coming out of spiritual Babylon. And there's, Sister White plainly says it, Sister White plainly says, says it more than once. There's a compilation of Sister White called Lessons from the Life of Nehemiah, where she says it several times that the work that was carried on in rebuilding the temple and the walls parallels the work that modern Israel is to do at the end of the world. So the history of the three decrees is a parallel history to the Millerites. And there, therefore, there will be a messenger in the history of the three decrees. Who's the messenger in the history of the three decrees? We have the quote. We'll read it. Remember, I'm going forward. We'll read it to you this afternoon. It was Cyrus. Cyrus understood that it was time for the children of Israel to come out of Babylon and do the work. Mr. So White confirms that. That's, that's not my interpretation of it, honestly. But Cyrus backslid on his decision to participate in rebuilding Jerusalem. Yeah. And in Daniel chapter 10, when Daniel begins to pray and fast for three weeks, Gabriel comes to Daniel. He says, I was laboring with the leadership of the Medes and Persians. I was leadering, laboring with Cyrus and I could not prevail, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came and turned God Cyrus on track. You can see what Sister White says. It wasn't until Michael came down that Cyrus' message was 
in power. One more. There's more, but one more. <clears throat> When, when ancient Israel came out of Egypt, the messenger was Moses. Before Moses came back to Egypt and accomplished his work, there was something that he had forgot to do. And Sister White says if that action hadn't taken place, that he would have been powerless to do his work in Egypt. And in Exodus chapter 5, when this action takes place, it says the Lord came down to Moses. And what was it that the Lord came down to do? Circumcision. Moses' message was empowered. He would have been powerless had not the circumcision taken place. When the Lord came down before he went to Egypt, and just, Moses says, the Lord thy God will raise up a prophet like unto myself. We find that in the book of Acts. Christ and Moses are parallel types prophetically. And at the baptism of Christ, the message of John the Baptist was empowered. And at the circumcision of Moses' son, Moses' message was empowered. And circumcision is a type of baptism. So what I'm saying to, hear, to you here as we close is that based upon Great Controversy, page 343, every reform movement parallels all the other reform movements, but all the prophetic testimony is illustrating the end of the world. And if we will bring prophetic line upon prophetic line from these reformatory movements together, then we will be illustrating the steps, the process, the experience that takes place in the reformatory movement when the Lord raises up 144,000. And by the time we get, to get done with this presentation, you will also see that we will identify where the foundations are laid in each of these generations, and we will be raising up the foundations of many generations. Mm -hmm. And we will also identify that the history that begins the process of raising up 144,000 is already underway. And we are required to understand this history. We will give you the quotes that say so, uh, one that you're familiar with, goes something like this. We have nothing to fear for the future, except we forget the Lord's teachings in our past history and experience. We have to understand what took place in the reformatory movement of the Millerites, because that history is going to be repeated, is being repeated this very day. Hope you can make it back this afternoon. Um, do we have a closing talk? Can I ask you one question? I missed it somewhere where the falling of the stars have to do with whatever. Mr. Wright says that the falling of the stars is the last sign to take place before the coming of the Lord. And in these histories, once you have these histories in place, okay, you'll find several lessons that are in these histories. And one of the histories, one of the lessons in each of these histories is that there are always signs. So you, you mark the signs. That, you know, in, in this, the history of Egypt, it was the signs and wonders that were done in Egypt. In the history of Christ, we already read one of the signs in John 2.20 when the Jews asked for a sign. He says, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. The signs for the Millerites was the falling of the star of the dark day. So there is a lesson there that I didn't touch on because we're not at that point. We have a sign that we're required to see as well. Thank you.